First of all, so thank you to you for being here. Thank you especially to the Middle East Children's Alliance, to Barbara and Ziad and to Josie and to Penny and to Deborah uh, for all of the hard work that you continue to do. I was first introduced to Mecca as an undergraduate student at Berkeley when I was not studying engineering, <laughs> to the chagrin of my family. <laughs> but I lived close enough, it wasn't an issue. <laughs> So, um, and, and, and first met Ziad when I went to Deshe to actually teach, help teach English, teach English, help teach English to these children who can teach me English before they came on their tour in the United States. And I'm a friend of KPFA and all the organizations here and AROC, um, which is doing fabulous work. Um, and I hope that they take the floor and that you all join them in, in the critical work that they're doing. And I especially want us all to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the presence of Cheryl Davila, who, yes, yes. Yes, so for those of you maybe living in a bubble, um, you missed the news that Cheryl went through an experience here in Berkeley, which is a very common experience for those who dare to speak out. She introduced BDS in the, uh, in the Berkeley Human Rights Commission and was punished for it by being fired from a job that she had. And she, in response, decides to run against the gentleman who fired, for him, fired her and take his seat on the city council as now our representative for District 2. Congratulations, Cheryl. She is defining, she is defining what it means to fight back and setting an example of how we will continue to fight back so that we not only just survive, but that we prevail. So with that, thank you so much for being here um, and to all of you. What I'll be doing in this talk is building somewhat interestingly on what Yara was sharing with us. So you heard Yara in her discussion saying things that become very familiar to us, you know, um, in the summer of 2014, Israel waged the third, uh, its third military onslaught against the besieged Gaza Strip in six and a half years, between 2008 and 2014. But that attack was actually the 14th attack since its unilateral withdrawal in 2005 and the 22nd attack since announcing unilateral withdrawal in April 2004. Not only did they, has Israel placed uh, the Gaza Strip and its pop civilian population under a siege where it controls all points of ingress and egress minus the Rafah border which is controlled by collusion by Egypt, uh, it has left them on a subsistence diet of survival. During the war it sealed the borders, didn't allow them to become refugees, fired, fought, I think it was uh, 6,000 airstrikes on a besiege, and let me just show you. Okay, so what I want, what I want just point out here, so here's the Gaza Strip, 365 square kilometers. It's pretty tiny. Now, at the time of the war in 2014, the population was 1.7 million, three-fourths of whom were refugees, which means they were already on some sort of aid for survival. Now the population is 2 million, which tells you something about their condition. The, during the war, the border, the, these, the buffer zone was expanded by 44%, which means that that 1.7 million people were concentrated into the, in the center and subjected to 6,000 airstrikes, 50,000 artillery shells. Nothing was sacred. Nothing was not a target. Seven UNRWA schools, seven schools that are run by the United Nations Relief Works agencies with emblems on the top that can be seen from an aerial view were struck. 56 clinics, 17 hospitals, 18,000 homes were destroyed. At the height of this, a half a million Palestinians were displaced, were forcibly displaced. There was nowhere to run, and so the carnage was inevitable. 2,200 Palestinians in a span of 51 days, 534 of whom were children. After this, 
approximately 365,000 children were in need of psychosocial treatment because so often we, we recall these figures as numbers and statistics and not lives that are destroyed and spirits that are broken. And how are they going to rehabilitate in this condition? And yet, and yet, that is not the moral imperative of the way we discuss this. The way we discuss this in the way that Yada highlight, highlighted very ironically and very emotionally in her song was that they're all Hamas suspects, right? That this was the responsibility of Hamas, just so we can get a clue, by the way, uh, there's approximately 15,000 members of Hamas in a population of 1.7 million if we're thinking about 2014. So what does it look like to want to target 15,000 Hamas members who are both in the military wing and in the political wing because Hamas is a political party. It was democratically elected to represent the Palestinian people in 2006. It is the representative of an embryonic sovereign. If we believe that Palestinians are a people, and we believe that Palestinians have the right to self-determination, then we must believe that Hamas also represents them and is the embryonic sovereign. It is a nascent state, which gives it rights to defend its population, which gives it rights to police its people. That's an illegal framework. And outside of that framework, just as a moral frame, everybody has the right to defend themselves. I'm gonna talk a lot about the law, but let me just make clear that I'm discussing the law because it's critical in understanding this, not because it should be the compass by which we should understand this conflict, just to be very clear, okay? Um, but in the course of this, we come to understand that the casualties are the responsibility of Hamas using the population as human shields. 15,000 people in a population of 1.7 million, isn't everyone suddenly a human shield by default? What does that mean in the language of law? What Israel is telling us is that everybody is then fair game, that the number of collateral damage is elastic. What's acceptable as collateral damage and proportionality becomes elastic. What we also hear is that any use of force is terrorism. Regardless if Hamas was targeting a military installation and whether or not it was trying to shoot a soldier or whether in fact it was recklessly targeting civilians, as far as the media and as Israel is concerned, they, everything it did, every use of force was a matter of terrorism. What we hear, on the other hand, no matter what Israel does, and just to compare these figures, of the casualties, of the casualties, of the Palestinian casualties, 70% of them are civilians. Of Hamas's casualties, which pale even in, in number, 7.5% of them were civilians. And yet, the way we come to understand Israel's use of force is as a legitimate force of self, a legitimate use of self-defense. And Yaro is telling us, no, it's terrorism. So what is that about? What is that about? And if we don't believe it in this room, that in fact that's not, that's not the case, then how come nobody has been prosecuted? How come there have been no sanctions against Israel as a response minus what the U.S., the Obama administration, for a short period of time stopped selling Hellfire jet missiles and now has resumed selling them. How is there not warrants all over the world for these war criminals? And what I want to demonstrate is that the reason that we can be morally outraged and yet we can see no and, and yet we can see this language seeping and no repercussions as a matter of law is because Israel is waging this war and this carnage within a language of law that suggests that everything that it's doing is legal, that in fact this was proportionate, that there was no targeting of civilians, that they can do it again, and more, that other states can do it too. Because what they're doing is shifting customary law on the methods and means of warfare 
not just for Israel vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, but for every other country that wants to use force against non-state actors. And so what I want to explain in this talk is how. How is that possible? What did we miss? When did this start? And how is, what are the implications? So actually, if we can go back, okay, watch the video. I want to show you, some. this is a video from March 2016 in Hebron. I want you to pay attention to this guy right here. There's a Palestinian on the floor. He's incapacitated. He cannot move. Did you see that? Maybe I should have given a trigger warning. I apologize. All right, so if it wasn't clear, it's fine. It's, it's a pretty gruesome video. Um, this was from March 2016. Here, what we understand is that two Palestinians attempted to stab soldiers at a checkpoint in Hebron. Hebron being one of the worst sites of settler colonial violence. This man here was already incapacitated. He was already shot. He's on the floor. He cannot move. He cannot hurt anybody at, at that point. Under a law enforcement framework, which is the framework that regulates the use of force in an occupation, in a military occupation, this man should be picked up, should be given treatment, should be given a trial to determine guilt. What we see instead is that the soldier casually picks up his rifle, shoots him in the head, executes him, and if you didn't notice anything weird happening, it's because nobody in the video flinched. None of the other soldiers thought that that was strange either. And the only reason this became a major case in Israel and is still receiving, you know, still in the headlines, is because he didn't receive superior orders to kill him. So for the Minister of Defense at the time, Moshe Alon, his concern was that we have soldiers who are not waiting to receive military orders before they execute Palestinians, but had he received that order, it would have been fine. I know for those of us who pay attention to this conflict, this doesn't seem like a big deal because it seems like a common occurrence. And especially since October 2015, you're right, 218 Palestinians have been killed in this way. They've been accused of attacking a soldier or carrying a knife. They never get a trial. They, the, the soldiers can as much as tell us that they were going to harm them, and that's enough so that Israel gets to be the judge, jury, and executioner. But that's not. That condition and what we saw right there actually represents the same seed and the same story from which the justification uh, used to pummel the Gaza Strip comes from. So, to tell you how we shift from an occupation law framework to a framework of war, the story begins in September 2000. In September 2000, as you remember, the Camp David, uh, excuse me, the second, uh, what's popularly known as the Second Palestinian Intifada begins, or the Al-Aqsa Intifada, begins um, in September 2000 in the aftermath of a failed and collapsed Camp David Accord. So at this point, the Oslo had been signed for seven years. In the course of seven years, under a labor government led by Ehud Barak, settlements uh, increase by 100%. There's no change on the ground. There's a tension that's building up. And what happens at Camp David is that Ehud Barak offers what's popularly known as the most generous offer to Palestinians. That most generous offer would have maintained East Jerusalem as part of a united Israeli capital, would have given the Palestinians just a, what they called a symbolic foothold. It would have, Israel refused to return to the 1949 armistice lines. It explicitly wanted to annex 10% of the West Bank and keep it to maintain that it was home to 150,000 settlers. So you all are familiar with this, but this is the map. These lines right here are completely imaginary. They've never existed. Israel has never declared its borders. These borders are a false partition because of how Israel builds, um, expands its settlement enterprise, has expanded it into the West Bank since 1967. In fact, 
as soon in the aftermath of the 1967 Six-Day War began its settlement enterprise even before the Security Council passed Resolution 242 in November 1967. This is the map of what was offered at Camp David. This is the most generous offer. All of those territories would have been retained. Um, sorry, these would have been for the, under Palestinian self-autonomy, under auto an autonomy framework that's first expressed at the Camp David um, Accords in 1979 between Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. So Palestinians aren't offered sovereignty or a state even, they're offered autonomy. They can govern themselves under in these Bantustans. Israel would have retained the Jordan Valley, as well as all of Jerusalem, a corridor that cuts across that will connect Tel Aviv to the, to the uh, border with Jordan or the Jordan River. Here's Jerusalem, so it cuts across, it guts Palestinian economic social fabric. This was the most generous offer. Arafat refused this because he had already capitulated so much in the course of Oslo. In refusing it, we see what erupts as the second um, Palestinian intifada, which is provoked uh, a provocation by Ariel Sharon when he stepped onto uh, Haram al-Sharif during Friday prayer with a thousand Israeli troops. So this begins on the first day, it begins as a clash between the sol soldiers and the worshippers when they killed five, Palestinian, uh, five Palestinians and continues to, to, to grow into all-out hostilities and conflict. But that, the hostilities that break out were to be expected because Israel viewed its incremental withdrawal from the, God, from, from the West Bank as a matter of security. So as a result of Oslo, what they do is they designate Area A to come under full Palestinian civil military control, Area B to come under uh, Palestinian civil control, Israeli military control, and the rest of that dark area, that dark matter, so to speak, comes under Israeli military and civilian control, 62% of the West Bank, which now the Israeli Knesset is proposing to all-out annex, and that Trump is supporting, might support this annexation. Why am I saying this? You all know this story, because here's where the legal, the legal stuff turns on. Area A constitutes 12% of the occupied territory. The argument that Israel was making is that its effective control, which is the test upon which the presence of an occupation term turns, according to Article 43 of the Hague Regulations, if that the, its effective control in 12% of the West Bank was diminished. If it didn't have effective control in these areas, it was no longer responsible to the population under occupation. Does that make sense? All right. So what it's saying is that when it withdrew its troops from those areas, that all the Palestinians therein become military threats. So it's maintaining its occupation in 88%, but in that 12%, they now securitize all the civilians who otherwise, under an occupation framework, would be under their duty to protect. Also consider that during this time, what happens in July 2000, just before the Al-Aqsa uh, Intifada, Israel withdraws from the south of Lebanon, which we can't take lightly at all, because now the only military frontier left for the Israeli army is the occupied territories, a site for it to demonstrate its use of force. So now you have seven years that have demonstrated the futility of Oslo and in fact what it was meant to be, which was basically entrenching a status quo of domination. You also see a 100% increase in the number of settlements. We also witness that the most generous offer is devastating and getting nowhere to statehood. And that's another conversation I'm happy to answer it in the Q&A. Statehood has never been on the negotiating table. So just to be clear, we talk about the two-state solution. Palestinians have never negotiated for a state. They've been negotiating for autonomy. Um, and so we see that clearly. We see a frustration develop, and we also see the rise of a new generation of leaders that now see all of the PLO old guard as part of the problem. 
and no longer want to negotiate with Israel, but in fact want to establish a Palestinian state by militarily forcing them out. This confluence of factors comes together. We see the beginning of the Al-Aqsa Intifada, and it lasts for five years until 2005. In the course of those five years, 950 Israelis are killed, 3,223 Palestinians are killed. It features aerial, uh, gum, Israeli aerial gunships, live ammunition, tanks, snipers, as well as Palestinian suicide bombers and rockets. Right? So after five years, it's fair to say that this was unprecedented, that the use of force in the conflict has now gone from rock throwing to a full-on militarized conflict. But Israel declared it unprecedented and changed the rules of the game six weeks into the uprising. 42 days into the uprising, when 90%, excuse me, 90% of the 180 people killed were Palestinians. So what explains that? What's going on? On November 9th, 2000, this is exactly the 42-day mark, Israel launched its first extrajudicial assassination. Again, I think that, the, that what's really interesting about this is how desensitized we are. You might actually be more familiar with it if I call it targeted killings. How many of you are familiar with targeted killings? Extrajudicial assassination? Well, it's Berkeley, so, or Oakland, excuse me, it's the East Bay. Israel introduces this to the world and uses it and popularizes it and makes it a use of military force before the United States popularizes it, okay? There's a synergy that's happening. But when Israel uses it on November 9th, 2000, it targets two Palestinian men who are driving in broad daylight in a Jeep. They blow up the Jeep with aerial missiles. They kill four women around them and they take responsibility. So for those of you who are familiar also with this history, Israel's all, always assassinated Palestinians. Moshe Alon assassinated, assassinated Abu Jihad in Tunis in, a, in, in something that was everybody knew, but they never took responsibility for it. And that was the game changer. What is it doing when it's taking responsibility for an assassination? It's doing two things. The first, is that under any legal framework, assassination is illegal. That's why we don't call it assassination. That's why the US neuters the term and calls it targeted killing, right? Assassination remains illegal. It's an extrajudicial use of force. It's arbitrary killing and denying somebody the right to a trial. Now, can you shoot to kill a soldier? Absolutely, but those are rules of war. That's a status-based distinction. When a soldier signs up to fight in a war, that soldier is given something called belligerent privilege, which means that the soldier can kill and we won't call it murder. In most cases, we do not call it murder. The soldier has a right to kill. The soldier also assumes the risk of being killed. All right? Civilians caught in warfare do not have the right to kill. If they kill, it's murder. And if they are killed, it's their collateral damage. Right? So that's that's why you can't just shoot to kill anybody. Under the occupation law framework, all the civilians under the occupation live under law enforcement. When an occupying power occupies a people or a territory, it's, it's actually very legal. It's part of the laws of war. It's meant to be the buffer between wartime and peacetime, to transition between hostilities and peacetime, to revert to the status quo ante. We expect occupations to happen, but occupations are meant to be short-term in nature, five to 10 years. When they last for decades, we're no longer dealing with an occupation. We're dealing with something much more insidious. And yet under this framework, and Israel has denied that it's been an occupying power using another legal acrobatic maneuver, which I can also discuss, but not now, um, Israel uh, has a duty to actually function as law enforcement. So when it shoots to kill Palestinians, it's saying it no longer has that responsibility. Plus, it's violating the laws prohibiting execution. Israelis knew that this was illegal under occupation law as well as under 
peacetime law, right? Which is that it's an extrajudicial assassination. And to meet the challenge, Israeli leaders charge the Israeli law division in the military advocate general's office with the task of developing a legal framework that would sanction assassination. And so at that time, Colonel Daniel Reisner, who headed this division between 1995 and 2004, explained, quote, effectively, the question was whether we could treat terrorists like an army and use force against them openly. We wrote a revolutionary opinion stating that above a certain level, fighting terrorism is analogous to war and that subject to very specific rules, we will authorize such attacks. So this is revolutionary in 2000. Unfortunately, we're too desensitized to it because our country has been fighting this war for over a decade. But there is no such thing as a war on terror. Terrorism is a criminal problem. Terrorism should be combated through criminal law under a domestic law framework. You can't fight a war against terrorists and use military force against a non-state. You certainly can't do it against civilians living under occupation. And in fact, there was pushback. There was tremendous pushback. Because if Israel wanted to use this kind of force against Palestinians, it has two available legal frameworks to do so. One of them is called a non-international armed conflict, which is the same thing as civil war. And by the way, in civil war, you don't, you, uh, civilians can't shoot to kill. They're also prosecuted for murder, da 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 But why wouldn't Israel classify this as a non-international armed conflict? Because if it admitted that Palestinians lived within its jurisdiction, it would have to admit that the partition between Israel and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip was false. And that in fact, it is the singular, singular jurisdiction of, uh, overseeing an apartheid regime. So it doesn't want to call it a civil war. The other option available to it, it's not, a, it's not a war against the state. Palestinians don't have a state. But there's something else in international law. It's an international armed conflict. And it includes, since the additional protocols of 1977, wars of national liberation. When this 1977 protocols were passed, which were basically seen as the addendum to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, which regulate war, it recognized that across the globe, peoples in Angola, in Mozambique, in Namibia, in South Africa, in Vietnam, in Palestine, were fighting wars of national liberation. And those wars were being waged by a people's liberation army that has the right to use force. Okay, now your cynicism about law can come in, that's fine. I'm just trying to share with you that we, th these things are not new, that they've been contemplated. That the exceptionalism that Israel speaks about this is actually a fabricated exceptionalism because it's been dealing with this problem. In fact, when it objected and called Palestinian use of force as terrorism in the 60s and the 70s, the UN Security Council said no and said Israel, Portugal, Portugal, which um, was the colonial power of uh, Angola and Mozambique, and South Africa, the Afrikaner, um, South African regime, could not claim to use self-defense against the territory it illegally occupied. We've already been here before. This has already been rejected as a matter of law. And that's, in fact, Israel rejects the additional protocols and says there's no such thing as a national liberation movement even though Palestinians organized themselves in an army in 1966 in something called the Palestinian Liberation Army, and did have a chain of command, and has been waging this war, and has claimed that it is a state under occupation and remains an embryonic sovereign. But Israel has rejected this. If it was an embryonic sovereign, what does that give Palestinians the right to do? Gives them the right to use force to defend themselves. It means that when they kill civilians, that those civilians are collateral damage. It means that they are supposed to capture soldiers, enemy soldiers, so that they can exchange them for other prisoners of war. It means that when Palestinian soldiers are caught, that they are to be exchanged as prisoners of war and not indefinite criminals. I'm not in any way here trying to advocate, let's just let them fight this out, right? 
I'm not here advocating war. I'm trying to highlight that this is already something that's been contemplated, that this kind of warfare and this use of violence. Israel's rejection of it is deliberate in order to color all Palestinian use of force as criminal, regardless of whether they target soldiers or civilians, regardless of whether they use precision weapons or indiscriminate weapons. That anything then that Palestinians do is ipso facto criminal because they shouldn't even use force. But how does that happen? How does Israel make that possible? If everybody, if the Security Council in the 60s and 70s said that that is not acceptable, if these are the laws of war that regulate these kinds of hostilities, and we've already contemplated that national liberation movements exist and can use force, in 1960, there was a UN passed a declaration that said people under occupations have the right to use force. How then does that, where does that go? And that has everything to do with the way that international law works. I don't want to bore you too much, but I think it's critical that we understand that international law is comprised primarily of two things. One is treaties, what states do bilaterally or multilaterally, and it's explicit consent to behave a certain way, okay? Those were the Geneva Conventions, the additional protocols, those are all treaties, you have to sign them. The Rome Statute bringing the ICC into existence, that's a treaty. Then there's something called customary law. Customary law is kind of like how you deal with your family, right? There's just certain things you do as a matter of custom. That it's the way that you behave with one another. And so it's built on two things. It's built on what states believe are legal, and it's built on state practice. How can you change customary law? You can change it if enough states do what you're doing, or if enough states don't protest what you're doing. So think about the preventive use of force. In 1981, Israel struck a nuclear reactor in Osirak in Iraq, or Iraq, okay? At the time, it was condemned as a preventive use of force. You can't use force before you're attacked. 2003, what happens? The United States attacks Iraq again, preemptively, because it says it has weapons of mass destruction that it will use against us which obviously after we've destroyed the country and it continues to be gutted, have never been produced, okay? In 1981, we rejected preventive self-defense. 2003, there was protest, but it wasn't enough. And preventive and preemptive self-defense has now come within the rubric of the acceptable as a matter of customary law, all right? So what does Daniel Reisner tell us about this? He says, quote, what we are now seeing is a revision of internet. Daniel Reisner was the colonel who introduced this new law in the West Bank. He calls it armed conflict short of war. Armed conflict short of war. That didn't exist. He made it up and says I made it up. And I'm really proud that I made it up. I got to debate him at the Middle East Institute in Singapore. He's proud that he made this up. Um, armed conflict short of war gets around this legal regulation because it's not an occupation. They say it's not an occupation because they took, they're now out of the area, area A. They don't have effective control. They're not, the, they're not the occupying power there anymore. They can remain an occupation of 88% of it, but not there. It's not a civil war because then it's explicitly an apartheid regime, even though de facto we already know it is. And it's not a war against a national liberation movement because Israel continues to deny that Palestinians are a people. They're just a bunch of Arabs from Jordan and Lebanon and Syria that happen to be there. So they're not a nation. And without a nation, without a state, you can't fight these wars. So instead, if it's not any of those three, what is it? An armed conflict short of war. And what he says is, quote, what we are seeing now is a revision of international law. If you do something for long enough, the world will accept it. The whole of international law is now based on the notion that an act that is forbidden today becomes permissible if executed by enough countries. International law progresses through violations. We invented the targeted assassination thesis and we had to push it. But when they first invented it in 2000, it was rejected. It was rejected by all of the world, including the United States. At the time, the United States put together something called the Sharm el-Sheikh Fact-Finding Commission, which was then led by Senator George Mitchell, 
you all might popularly know, they published, he published something called the Mitchell Report. The Mitchell Report rejected Israel's characterization of the conflict as something that couldn't be regulated by existing law or what Israel called sui generis, and called on Israel to, quote, abandon the blanket characterization of the current uprising as an armed conflict short of war for failing to discriminate between terrorism and protest, recommended that Israel revert to the concept of law enforcement. It said that you have to investigate every single Palestinian death to make sure that, in fact, whether or not it was legal and punish the soldiers who kill them. That doesn't happen. Even under the Bush administration in June 2000, the Bush administration put together, led by CIA director at the time, George Tenet. The Tenet report affirmed the same thing. Israel cannot wage a con an armed conflict short of war. It cannot shoot to kill Palestinians. It has to abide by occupation law. Two months after the United States released the Tenet report in August 2001, Israel assassinates two more Hamas leaders, Jamal Mansour and Jamal Salim Damouni, and killed another four bystanders. At that time, Secretary of State Colin Powell comes out and says, this is absolutely wrong. Israel has gone too far. Ari Fleischer, the White House spokesperson, was grilled and was asked, do you stand by your statement when you said that the administration at all levels deplore violence there and includes targeted killings? And Fleischer responds, there is no doubt that is the position of the administration and it is shared by all members of it. Who does the next interview? Dick Cheney. Then Vice President Dick Cheney responds and says, actually, this is before, this is before, okay? September 2001, September 11th, 2001. This is before we launch our war on terror. Dick Cheney says, actually, there could be a situation where you know something is, might, is almost certain to happen, you just don't know when and by whom, and then you can use that force, that caused a friction in the White House between the Secretary of State and the Vice President. But what the White House affirmed is that, nope, it's illegal. We do not accept it. Then, September 11th, 2001 happens. Al-Qaeda hijacks four planes, f two planes, four, plane, four planes, excuse me, and um, uses them basically as weapons, uses humans as weapons to uh, crash into the World Trade Center and into the Pentagon. And everything changes. Not immediately, not immediately at all, but that becomes the most significant turning point. And the U.S.'s opposition begins to transform into explicit collaboration with Israel in the production of knowledge which is really critical. When we say knowledge is power, it is, because whoever has the right to produce knowledge gets to produce what we think is right and what we resist against. It also becomes the state practice of counterterrorism. The Bush administration assassinates its first Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula in 2002 when it uh, launches a strike against Al-Harithi in Yemen. And by the way, if we think the Bush administration was awful, the Obama administration launched 53 drone attacks in its first year in office, more than both terms of the Bush administration. So this wasn't about a neoconservative versus a liberal administration. The Obama administration has entrenched this practice and has actually brought these violations, Israeli violations, into now what we consider acceptable norms. So that when I say assassination, that might be less familiar to you than when I say targeted killing, which is now the discourse used to discuss this. Again, what Israeli and U.S. academics have done in our academy, national security, uh, security scholars, that intense level of knowledge production also bears upon what um, knowledge production is. Beyond the United States, however, the International Court of Justice, the European Parliament, the European Union, the high contracting parties, the Geneva Conventions, all said Israel cannot do this. And it was meaningful, their opposition was meaningful, but it was not enough because Israel's practice, its consistent practice was also meaningful and it was never held to account. 
This is why legal accountability matters. Yes, for justice, but more because if we're not holding a state to account, their violations become the rule. It becomes the new normal. So, and Daniel Reisner says, it took four months and four airplanes to change the opinion of the United States. Had it not been for those four planes, I am not sure we would have been able to develop the thesis of the war against terrorism on the present scale. This war against terrorism that we now understand that has shifted the framework from a criminal law framework to a military framework was gifted to the world by Israel and picked up by the United States. Okay, now, what does that have to do with the Gaza Strip? Um, in the Gaza Strip, so remember what I'm telling you now. All of these, all of these things that I'm telling you are basically colonial experimentations. This is another way for Israel to entrench its colonial domination. And it's experimenting with these new laws of war using Palestinian bodies as expendable subjects, right? So here's the guinea pig. If it works, we use it. If it doesn't work, slap on the wrist, moving on. Well, this experiment of, of the legal theory that the diminishing effective control means that it no longer has an occupying power comes to full and lethal bloom in the Gaza Strip. Why? Here's the Gaza Strip, 365 square kilometers. Israel unilaterally withdraws its soldiers in 2005 and now says, and this is very deliberate, we no longer have effective control over the Gaza Strip. So whereas in the West Bank, they didn't have effective control over 12%, in the Gaza Strip, they don't have effective control at all. So whereas in the West Bank, it's an armed conflict short of war, after 2005, this becomes all-out warfare. But it doesn't be, they, they're not saying they ended their occupation either. They say, excuse me, they do say they ended their occupation. Even though we can demonstrate they don't end the occupation, they, continue to control the population registry, the electromagnetic sphere, all points of ingress and egress. They have the right to enter and, and assert control at any time that they want, so an occupation still exists. That's another legal analysis, but it doesn't matter with what happens on the ground. The point is they say their occupation ends, but what should happen after an occupation ends? Sovereignty should be restored. But Israel says there is no sovereignty. Palestinians don't have sovereignty in the Gaza Strip. It is a hostile entity. The same way they made up, by the way, the language for this, when I say made up an exception, the language for this in law is something. How many lawyers in the room? Yeah, right? How cynical is this? Sui generis, are you familiar with sui generis? So this plays on the idea that there's nothing else like it in law so you can't apply precedent law, which is a precedent-based concept. You can't apply it by precedent or analogy. It's sui generis. Nothing else like, like it exists. So where should the law come from if it's sui generis? We'll make it up. They made up armed conflict short of war. Now they're making up a new legal regime. Gaza Strip is a hostile entity. What does that mean for the population of Gaza if it's a hostile entity? They're a captive population who are subject to these colonial experimentations. And there just is not enough protest and resistance to it. So the numbers that I gave you at the beginning, those horrifying numbers, I can explain how they all come to be justified in the language of law. I'm going to spare you. I feel like that's not. But let me give you just one, just one way of how this gets translated. In warfare, by the way, I'm a civilian. I've always been a civilian. I will always be a civilian. I've never been. I'm, a, I'm a, a different kind of soldier, right, for peace. So I've never been in war. So I'm not talking about any kind of battleground experience. <laughs> but in warfare, because I talk a lot about war, I don't want you to think, you know. Anyway, in warfare, there's something called, for, there's something called proportionality. The concept of proportionality means that a, 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 a state or an army must balance humanitarian concern with military advantage. So, let me give you an example. I want to take over, I want to take, or let's take Aleppo. How many of you are following Aleppo and Syria? That's a good example, okay. The Syrian regime wants to take back Aleppo from the rebels, right? Their military advantage will be achieved when they can exert control over Aleppo again. Now, 
Can they carpet bomb Aleppo in order to take it back? No. Morally, hell no. But also legally, no. Legally, that amount of force that they use has to be proportionate to the humanitarian damage that they cause. If the humanitarian cost is too high, it's disproportionate. Disproportionality is a crime against humanity and a war crime. Okay? That's proportionality. We got it? Now, let's think about something else. Force protection. Force protection is a concept in war that says that we protect our soldiers. The more soldiers we can keep alive, the higher our military advantage is, right? So if I go to war and seven out of my ten soldiers die, I kind of wasn't a good general. Three out of my soldiers die and we win, it's not bad. That's good force protection, okay? Force protection is part of military advantage and considered part of the proportionality schema. So you see the relationship between those two. Now, what is Israel doing in 2003 in the midst of the Second Intifada? Asa Kasher and Amos Yadlin, who are ethicists at Tel Aviv University, which is why we should boycott uh, academic universities as well, right? They publish an essay that basically says, you know what? Soldiers are the same thing as civilians when they fight against terrorists. Soldiers, not only that, but in a proportionality assessment, our soldiers' lives are worth more than enemy civilian lives in a terrorist battleground. Why? Because they say that a combatant is a civilian in uniform. In Israel, quite often he is a conscript or on reserve duty, which is true. The entire population is conscripted, with few exceptions. His blood is as red and thick as that of the citizens who are not in uniform. His life is as precious as the life of anyone else. The fact that persons involved in terror are depicted as non-combatants, meaning civilians, is not a reason for jeopardizing the combatant's life in their pursuit. He has to fight against terrorists because they are involved in terror. They shoulder the responsibility for their encounter with the combatant and should therefore bear the consequences. So notice that everything that we know about war, why do we call soldiers brave? We call them brave because they're taking a big risk. They're risking their life. We also don't call them murderers because we think that their, their killing is legitimate on a battleground. Now what we're saying is that they can kill without distinction. Civilians can't defend themselves in response and that their lives are worth more than the en enemy civilians in a terrorist battleground. What does that do to a proportionality assessment? You basically get to kill many, 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 many more civilians and call it proportionate. And that's exactly what happens. And Israeli society, by the way, because this is related to society as well, Israeli society is really sensitive because all of their daughters and sons and cousins are conscripted into the army. And they're very sensitive that they can be killed. So they'd rather kill by air than kill in ground combat. Because if you can carpet bomb your adversary, you get to keep all your soldiers and you get to win. That's the logic. That's the slippery slope of this logic, right? And they're really sensitive to it, so sensitive to it that they have, uh, it's, they, they have something called the Hannibal Doctrine. Are you familiar with the Hannibal Doctrine? The Hannibal Doctrine emerges in the late 80s in, uh, when Hezbollah kidnaps two Israeli soldiers. And Israel determines that in that case, we should actually use more firepower than is necessary, even at the risk of killing our own soldier, so that they can't hold one of our soldiers in exchange as a POW. It's too embarrassing, right? And so after the, um, after the capture of Gilad Shalit in 2006, which, by the way, was collective trauma for Israeli society, they decided after he was exchanged for 1,027 Palestinian prisoners, they decided that thereafter any soldier can initiate a Hannibal Doctrine even without superior orders. What does that mean? Consider what it meant in Rafah in August 2014 when the Givati Brigade um, thought that one of its so soldiers was captured. So they initiated uh, a Hannibal Doctrine to rescue Hadar Golden, who was missing. 
They, the Israeli troops sealed one and a half mile radius around the su suspected capture point to prevent anyone from fleeing. So one and a half mile radius they sealed. Then for the next two days, Israeli soldiers fired 500 artillery shells and launched 100 airstrikes on the area. By late afternoon on the second day of the operation, Israeli soldiers discovered the remains of their um, fellow soldier, Hadar Golden, and determined that he was never captured. He was killed before the operation had started. But at the end, 190 Palestinians had already been killed, including 55 children, 36 women, and five men over the age of 60. When this general who launched this, or this, he's not a general, he's a, he's a commander, which is why he was in superior orders. When he was asked, was this right? He said, quote, yes. That's why we used all this force. Those who kidnap need to know they will pay a price. This was not revenge. They simply messed with the wrong brigade. But in the language of law, this number of casualties becomes OK because of the concept of force protection. And now it's proportionate. So when Kasher was asked about this, he said, Kasher was one of the authors, the academics, who is creating these new concepts. He says, the concept of proportionality has changed. There's no logic in comparing the number of civilians and armed fighters on the Palestinian side or comparing the number of Israelis killed by Qassam rockets to the number of Palestinians killed in Gaza. He's basically saying, we have a carte blanche. And that carte blanche is being pushed in the language of law, and it's being pushed in a way that's being accepted by the rest of the world. So you would think, hell no. This is horrifying. How are they possibly going to make this possible and put all these civilians at risk in Palestine and across the globe? Well, the truth is, is that there's very little protest to this. Very little protest to this, not only on the international level. On the international level, we've already seen that there's been two commissions of inquiry, one by UNRWA, one by the Human Rights Council. Both findings have been shelved. There's no attention to it. There's no accountability on Israel. Every time there's going to be accountability, the US response is, you can't uh, hold Israel to account because then you're going to compromise the peace process. Eyes roll. Right. But it's not just the US and Israel. Even Palestinians and Arab governments are not protesting. So that the Palestinian Authority, the Fatah-dominated Palestinian Authority, is actually in collusion and exchanging information so that Israel can assassinate Hamas leaders. During the first Operation Cast Lead, the 2009 operation, they actually coordinated with Israeli forces to stop protests in the West Bank, when that's exactly what we should be doing everywhere. Egypt is colluding in the imposition of the siege by controlling the Rafah border. Not only that, but they have now exchanged uh, military, uh, their, their soldiers are being trained by Israeli soldiers. Saudi Arabia, oh, and Egypt has declared that Hamas is a terrorist organization, mostly because of their association with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And Saudi Arabia has placed Hezbollah, which is similar in nature, onto a terrorist list. And so you have regional reconfigurations that make this problem not just against those that you know the people that we know do this the US and Israel but Palestinians and Egyptians and so, not the people not the people but the governments the PA Egypt uh, Saudi Arabia are also part of this and the really sad thing about all this is that not only is there not protest, but given the last 2014 ceasefire, which is a very tenuous ceasefire that didn't resolve any of the issues, what we saw in 2014 was not the last onslaught we are going to see. It is a holding position. It will happen again. And the, the carnage that we saw might not even be the worst of the carnage to come. And so that's why when we think about international law and we think about what states do and we kind of start to feel powerless, that's absolutely not true. Our protest is effective and it's necessary. Our protest is the only thing that is going to push back to make sure that this doesn't become law and it doesn't become the new normal because we must accept that this is not normal. This is absolutely absurd and just another, you know, what they, they say that this is the emperor's new clothes. 
This is settler colonialism's new clothes. And so we must, we must resist it in the form of our protests now and moving forward. Thank you very much. I need, I need to give you a round of applause. <laughs> I need to give you a round of applause because I'm looking at you and I'm like, are they really interested in this law stuff? And so, but I just, I mean, part of the work that I'm doing right now in this, this book that I'm working on is trying to translate how, you know, law and legal specialization creates a realm that becomes very inaccessible to all of us and yet it is the most relevant to all of us. And so what is happening and why should we care? even if it sounds really cynical and we don't care. There was a, I don't know what the time is. What is my time? You have, uh, 45 minutes. I have 45 minutes. So I was requested to show something to you uh, before Q&A. Are we okay with that? Okay, awesome. So part of the work, um, part of the work that I do as a scholar activist, and I try to, my, my, my struggle is to merge those two things and not feel like they're two separate things, is to produce knowledge that's for everybody, right? And so in the midst of the 2014 war, or onslaught, I should say, what became really evident is that in all of the media, in all of the protests, the most that anybody was saying was that Israel went too far, but never that Israel did not have any right to do this, that the only crime here is that it remains an occupation of the Gaza Strip, right? So what we did, what I did with a team was produce a 20-minute multimedia documentary to respond to that and to place these wars in a settler colonial framework as opposed to a national security one, right? How are these war, wars advancing Israel's settler colonial ambitions to take the land without the people, right, based on two tenets? You have more land, uh, as much land as possible with, with as little Palestinians on it as possible. You concentrate as many Palestinians as possible on the smallest amount of land as possible. Okay? So how this becomes, Gaza as a frontier becomes part of that equation. But then what explains why Israel uses police force and security coordination with the West Bank and the PA in the West Bank, Fatah dominated PA in the West Bank, but uses all out warfare in the Gaza Strip? Interesting question. So I, we answer that question in part three of the film. And that's what I want to show you. So if we can turn down. This is what, the, this is what we're going to show, that this idea that Israel is responding to, um, Israel says that it's responding to suicide bombers, the first suicide bombing was in 1994, after the Ibrahimi ma uh, ma Mosque massacre in Hebron. The first mortar launch, first time Hamas launched a mortar into Israel, was after Israel's first uh, assassination in the West Bank in November 2000. So. The Gaza Strip is home to 1.8 million Palestinians, 1.2 million of whom are refugees from surrounding areas to which Israel does not allow them to return. In the summer 2014, Israel attacked the population of Gaza with unprecedented force. The 11th most powerful military in the world used warships, drones, missiles, one-ton bombs, and hellfire missiles to pummel the besieged Palestinian population, which had nowhere to hide.
But this register of death and destruction was not merely the ugly outcome of war. Israel directly targeted Palestinian civilians as well. Israeli warplanes attacked seven UNRWA schools providing shelter. In Jabalia, for example, the UN gave Israel its GPS coordinates 17 times to avoid hitting a school sheltering 3,000 people. Israel struck the school anyway and killed 17 Palestinians, including four children. Though unprecedented in degree, such military offensives have become a common feature of the coastal enclave. This was the third attack in six and a half years, the 14th time since Israel's settler withdrawal in 2005, and undoubtedly not the last onslaught against the Palestinians of Gaza. Some media outlets casting Israel as the aggressor against Hamas, despite the barrage of Hamas terrorist rockets. Accepted another next... barrage of Hamas rockets fired from Gaza toward Tel Aviv. Take a look at how Hamas terrorizes the country on a daily basis. Because Hamas and Al Qaeda are the same type of Islamist. Support Israel. Support yourself. During the devastating offensive, news media repeatedly framed the issue as Israel's fight against a marauding Muslim mob driven by religious hatred. Gaza seemed to float outside of history. But understanding these systematic offensives means understanding where Gaza fits in the larger question of Palestine. Israel claims that it's responding to Hamas rocket fire. But no one stopped to ask if Hamas didn't launch its first rocket until 2001, nor its first suicide attack until 1994, then what explains an ongoing conflict for nearly seven decades? If Hamas was not established until 1988, then why has Israel occupied the Gaza Strip since 1967? There are no rockets from the West Bank, from East Jerusalem, from Palestinian cities within Israel. So what explains Israel's abject disregard for those Palestinians? What explains settler takeovers, home demolitions, forced displacement, disproportionate use of force, arrest without due process, denial of entry, land confiscations and movement restrictions? The explanation is found in Israel's relationship to all Palestinians. Israel's campaign against the Gaza Strip is not Gaza-specific. It's Palestine-specific. Israel doesn't have a Hamas problem. It has a Palestine problem. And it's guided by two primary policies. The first is to obtain the maximum amount of Palestinian land with the minimum number of Palestinian people. And the second is to concentrate the maximum number of Palestinians onto a minimum amount of land. Israel pursues a settler colonial project. It removes Palestinians and replaces them with Jewish Israelis. And it does so through dispossession, displacement, and concentration towards all Palestinians regardless of where they live or what legal jurisdiction governs their lives. Israel achieves its goals using civil law in Israel, martial law in the West Bank, a mix of martial and administrative law in East Jerusalem, and all-out warfare in the Gaza Strip.
1948, Zionist militias, together with European support, established Israel in mandatory Palestine. This necessitated the systematic removal of the native Palestinian population and the demolition and destruction of their villages. Palestinians thus regard Israel's establishment as their Nakba, or catastrophe. For nearly two decades, Israel imposed martial law on its Palestinian citizens and dispossessed them in a series of land laws. Military orders, together with municipal master plans, have concentrated 46% of Palestinian Israelis in the Northern District. In the Negev, simmering plans will uproot up to 70,000 Palestinians and concentrate them in urban townships. Since occupying the West Bank in 1967, and especially under the veneer of the peace process, Israel has removed, displaced, and concentrated Palestinians through settlement expansion, military roads, firing zones, bypass roads, parastatal settler takeovers, the annexation wall, and land confiscation. The Israeli Knesset is making plans to formally annex Area C, or 62% of the West Bank. The same policy is being pursued in the Gaza Strip. In addition to those displaced and killed in 2014, Israel expanded its buffer zone by 44%, intensifying the territory's severe density. Since Israel can no longer deploy boots on the ground in Gaza, though not for a lack of trying, it concentrates Palestinians from the perimeter and maintains their subjugation with repeated military campaigns, euphemistically known as mowing the lawn. Despite the different approaches, the outcome is the same. Israel controls the greatest amount of Palestinian land with the least number of Palestinians and concentrates the greatest number of Palestinians on the least amount of fragmented lands. Why would Israel pursue warfare in the Gaza Strip rather than use its West Bank policy for displacement and control? There, it outsources security to Palestinian forces and foots the bill to international donors. Because Israel wants the West Bank. Its religious claims there are more pronounced. It desires control of the Western Aquifer, one of the most significant sources of water in the region. And it wants to control the easternmost border, the Jordan Valley. In contrast, Israel doesn't want the Gaza Strip. By 2005, Israel only had 8,000 settlers in the Gaza Strip compared to 400,000 in the West Bank. It considers Gaza a cancer. The Strip has always been a hotbed of popular resistance, well before Hamas's establishment. Israel has repeatedly tried and failed to suppress the population using violence as well as co-optation strategies. Since the early 90s, Israel has set Gaza apart from the rest of the conflict and pursued a policy of isolation, de-development, and control. 
As early as 1993, Shimon Peres told a UNESCO conference that he saw the Gaza Strip progressively evolving into a Palestinian state while the West Bank becomes an autonomous polity of Palestinians and Israeli settlers whose status and borders would eventually be defined. In preparation for a peace deal ending the first Intifada, Israel imported foreign labor to replace its Palestinian labor force. Together with the impact of the first Gulf War, the economic downturn in the Gaza Strip was severe. In March 1993, Israel imposed a complete closure of Gaza, which was never fully lifted again. By this time, the Gazan economy was already dependent on Israel and incapable of self-sustenance. Nine months later, Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization signed the Oslo Accords on the White House lawn. By 1993, Israel had made Gaza dependent, announced an intention to transform it into the Palestinian state, and had sealed it off. All of this without a single rocket or a single suicide attack. Hamas launched its first suicide attack on April 7, 1994, in retaliation for the murder of 29 Palestinians praying in the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron. Two years later, Benjamin Netanyahu assumed office and explicitly opposed the peace process. <laughs> When the peace process crumbled four years after that, it set off the second Palestinian Intifada. In this context, Hamas launched its first mortar into Israel in March 2001. In April 2004, then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon proposed complete withdrawal from Gaza in exchange for consolidation and control of the settlements in the West Bank. Unilateral disengagement in 2005 realized Israel's vision articulated by Shimon Peres in 1993. In the 18 months between Sharon's proposal and the execution, Israel launched eight military campaigns that expanded the northern and southern buffer zones between the Gaza Strip and Israel and assassinated several Hamas political and military leaders. Those campaigns have never stopped. Together, with the naval blockade and the land siege, the Gaza Strip has become a zone of death. Rocket fire and Hamas do not adequately explain what is happening in Gaza today. Israel militarily occupied the Gaza Strip in 1967 and has enclosed and impoverished it since 1991. Hamas did not emerge until 1988, did not launch its first suicide attack until 1994, and did not launch the first rocket attack until 2001. Even if Hamas were to disappear, Israel's policies towards the tiny coastal enclave would go uninterrupted because what Israel demands is for Palestinians to accept Israeli domination as a way of life, an unfathomable possibility to all humans whose first instinct is to be free. 
the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank has gone to great lengths to meet Israel's demands. In response to their overtures, Israel has increased the settler population from 200,000 in 1993 to 600,000 today and continues to remove and to concentrate Palestinians. Israel doesn't have a Hamas problem. It doesn't have a Gaza problem. It has a Palestine problem. The Gaza Strip represents the most vivid and grotesque form of Israel's settler colonial ambitions. Even before the start of Operation Protective Edge, the World Health Organization stated that the Gaza Strip would be unlivable by 2020. Much like Mars, where humans cannot survive due to a lack of oxygen, Palestinians will not be able to survive in Gaza due to the lack of hygiene, access to clean water, and food. But while Mars's harsh conditions are a product of nature, Gaza's conditions are the consequence of human collusion and complicity. Under these circumstances, a confrontation between Palestinians and Israel is inevitable. If we do nothing, Palestinians who continue to defy all odds will survive, as they have multiple onslaughts and decades of structural violence. But we should pay attention beyond the spectacle of war. Escaping this holding position demands a political solution, one that addresses the root of the conflict. And that root is Israel's desire to remove and erase Palestinians and to implant Jewish Israelis in their places. U.S. brokered peace talks have proposed and furthered ghettoized sovereignty as a solution. But Palestinians reject this and continue to demand freedom, equality, and dignity wherever they live, within Israel, within the Gaza Strip, within the West Bank, and beyond in the diaspora. What we see in Gaza is merely a symptom of this broader condition. It is untenable. It does not work. And unless we insist upon a viable alternative, we will see this horror repeated. Achieving a solution depends on each and every one of us. This is a human-made disaster, and it can and must be resolved with a human-made solution.